Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome. My name is Trevor Armel, the Marketing Lead at Forest Stewardship Council. I will be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining. Before I jump in and introduce the panel for today's discussion, a couple of housekeeping points. One, we are on LinkedIn Live. Um, please use the, the comment features for any questions that you may have throughout. We'll be trying to answer as many as we can as we, as we, as we progress. We'll also be asking and taking questions from the audience in between each presentation today and to answer questions at the end if we have time. The webinar is also recorded and will be shared after the event with registered participants. If you haven't registered, you can do this on the LinkedIn page. Um, so I think that's all in terms of housekeeping. So today's session is part of Out of the Woods, which is an FSC webinar series designed to spotlight and highlight the various value chains connected to forests and the role that sustainable forestry plays in protecting them. Today, the topic is about unlocking sustainable natural rubber. Um, once thought impossible to trace and therefore certify, um, this year, 2021, has um, in many ways changed the trajectory of sustainable natural rubber. There's much evidence um, that sustainable transformation is indeed possible, and we're with that very excited to talk to you today about the horizon of sustainable natural rubber. And with that, I'm excited to introduce the panelists who in their own way are change makers behind that transformation, representing the tire manufacturing, the footwear, and the upholstery um, industries. So let's introduce our panel and we'll start with Ulrich Antony, who is the head of natural rubber procurement at Pirelli, joining us from Singapore. Hello, Uli. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here. Thank you. And now on to Tina, who is the global sustainability lead at Hunter Boots, joining us from London. Hi, Tina. Hi, Trevor. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you. And next up, we have Dieter, who's joining the business development director from the Texco, joining from Belgium. Hello, Dieter. And now moving on to Sean Nyquist, who's the natural rubber value chain development manager um, from FSC, joining us from Cologne. Hello, Sean. Hey, Trevor. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Great. Okay. So as you can see from the panel, the um, rubber value chain is truly global. And as a final introduction, all of you in the audience who are joining um, uh, us here today, I can see in the chat many people joining from Vietnam, Thailand, UK, Germany, um, Accra. So yeah, good, good participation and, and um, wonderful to see you all. Now let's get started. So to kick things off, Sean is going to ground us in the natural rubber value chain, share a bit of an overview and a data-driven update from an FSC perspective on the state of certification. So with that, Sean, please take us away. Great. Thanks, Trevor. I think as a, a starting point, it's, it's useful to kind of set the stage with some imagery from uh, photos, photos and, and videos that we've been making in uh, Thailand as a result of new certification there. We've been doing interviews and uh, film production of, of smallholders that are certified there and uh, looking forward to sharing that soon. But uh, just to start, I think it's important to align everyone, people that might not be as familiar with the rubber value chain and what makes it unique. So here are the five stages represented here. Uh, in terms of, to give context, there's 6 million farmers globally producing natural rubber and predominantly rubber is coming from smallholders with 85% uh, coming from smallholders who usually have less than five hectares. And then because of the, the sheer number of smallholders, it is then traded to, to get to processing factories in order to get to the critical mass. It usually takes uh, several stages of trading before it reaches the factory. And uh, this can present major challenges when it comes to certification with, with knowing where the rubber is coming from. Uh, the, the third stage is when it reaches the processing plant. And this is kind of where the destiny of the end product is determined because there are different grades of rubber. 
being produced for different applications. Tire rubber is different from concentrated latex that goes into balloons and, and gloves, uh, which is different from, from footwear. And obviously the, the end market is, is dominated by tires and mobility, but rubber is used in everything. We need to remember that certification uh, of a product is not, does not just mean that it's certified at the forest level. It also has to be uh, guided through an unbroken chain of custody, which brings in its own certification standard so that we know that, that rubber is coming from an FSC certified plantation. Okay, I mentioned that the challenge that it's, it can be difficult to know where the rubber is coming from due to the, the number of, of smallholders and the, the, the distance that rubber can travel. But uh, I would like to quickly highlight the opportunities that we have been developing to address these challenges. Uh, each of these uh, deserves its own webinar, but essentially group FM certification and group chain of custody certification is working on the concept of economies of scale that you don't have to go to certification alone, but can, can do it as a group, uh, which reduces the auditing costs. SLIMF, this stands for small or low intensity managed forests. And this is a way in which smallholders uh, especially can uh, streamline their auditing and implementation requirements, uh, cutting down the costs. And then this third level down that, uh, this is something new. So it's, it's just being approved now for pilot next year in uh, four Asia Pacific countries, Indonesia, India, Vietnam, and Thailand. And the, the purpose of this, it's focused on smallholders and, it, and it's meant to do two things, simplify the language so that it's uh, something that, that a non-forestry expert can understand and to reduce the requirements that are not um, relevant to smallholders uh, in these areas. So there's 211 international generic indicators. Um, for this standard, it's 145. And we're looking for participants to, to use this pilot. And the last opportunity to address key challenges and something that is maybe a little bit more abstract, but is, is absolutely critical is uh, transparency and collaboration. You cannot certify your supply chain without doing this. Uh, so you need to find the right partners uh, to, to get certified. It cannot just be done by your organization. Now I'd like to give a, an update at a holistic level. How has certification been developing at that first stage with certified forests? In the last two years, the growth has been extremely linear, but we can see that it's very steep. And from 2019 till now, the certified forest area for rubber has has more has doubled. And um, this is showing both large plantations and also small holders. And geographically speaking, all the certified forest is coming from these six countries on the right, Guatemala, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. And now on this next slide, I wanna kind of hone in on how we're seeing that, that smallholder groups, smallholder group certification is really multiplying right now. Uh, and this, is, this growth is really coming from two different forms. On the left-hand side is a plot showing the number of smallholder groups that are getting certified. And, and it's really a, a hockey stick growth trend uh, exponential, uh, more than tripling in the last uh, 12 months. And the second area where growth is coming from is that existing certified groups are adding new members. Here's an example from a group called Agrac in Southern Thailand, which got certified in January of this year. And in just the last 12 months, they have gone from their initial size of 500 members and about 1800 hectares of total certified area to three times that size uh, by the, the start of Q1 of 2022. So they have been growing in the last 12 months and they, they plan to be three times their, their starting size by uh, January or February of 2022, and then continuing to grow by the following year. Um, so my time is, is pretty short now, but the message I, I want to convey in, in this last slide is that commonly people think that the, 
the bottleneck with certification is coming from smallholder certification for, for rubber. But uh, I, I think that that's really not the case. What, what it instead is, is, is whether or not there is willingness from brands and, and manufacturers to signal a demand to their suppliers for sustainable rubber. And uh, through collaboration and, uh, and transparency, whether they can really help their suppliers get to this level. Um, I know that the, the speakers on this, this call right now have indeed done this and I uh, think that they'll be able to share that better than me. Thank you for that, Sean. And with that, let's move right on to um, Pirelli, who has um, you know, done much of the work that you're mentioning to here today. So Uli, if you can share your screen, please feel free to get started. Yes, hi, Trevor. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, well, let me, I think you should see it now, correct? Yep. All good. Okay, perfect. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. So again, thanks a lot for, for having me with you. And um, it's really a pleasure to, be, to talk about uh, this fantastic project. So again, my name is Ulch Antoni. I work for Pirelli, located in Singapore, and I'm in charge of natural rubber procurement and, and natural rubber sustainability. So I will guide you through this project. We have done the first engagement story to produce the first FSC, the first FSC certified tire in the world. So I think it has been an amazing experience and we're quite proud of that. Okay, so a few words about um, the company. So Pirelli is obviously we are a tire maker. We are producing what we call consumer tires. And um, we mean consumer tires means car tires, motorcycle tires, and bicycle tires. Um, we we turn always around 5 billion euro. And uh, most of that is coming what we, from what we call the high value segment. Um, the company is quite some time around. So we will celebrate on our 150 year anniversary in a few weeks. So January 2022, we will complete 150 years. In terms of sales, of course, we are selling worldwide. Ma main market is still Europe, whilst of course then Asia Pacific and North America in the last few years gained a quite important share in our, our portfolio. We're producing tires um, in 18 factories uh, in 12 different countries around the world and um, so able to serve wherever. In terms of sustainability, I think we are part of most of the important sustainability ratings and initiatives. So we are part of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. We are part of the CDP Climate Global Impact Lead and again, a gold medalist in the S&P Global Sustainability Award. So, I mean, again, I think Jean helped a lot on, on under, try to understand what has FSC and the forest product to do um, with rubber. So let me show what a tire has to do with rubber. So I think it's important to get a bit of an understanding how a, a tire is done and what are the main ingredients. On the left side, you see a typical composition of a, of a car tire. And you see there are two materials which are part of, uh, which are I mean, originated from the forest. You see there is something like 20, 19, 20% of natural rubber in a, tire, in a car tire. And you see as well that on the down, I don't know if there's a cursor, if you see that there is um, something like four or 5% of a textile in our specific case, rayon. So it can originate it in a forest and that's why it will be part of my presentation, okay? So I think this one I can almost skip after the amazing um, introduction coming from Sean. Again, it's a bit, it's a complicated supply chain. I think we, we shall try to uh, underline that and make that very clear for those who are not so familiar with the supply chain. I think, you know, then when it comes to the product, normally we are using to produce our tires, which we call, is, is called cup lump. So it's the latex, which is then becoming in a, as it becoming solid, then it's even a bigger challenge. So latex, you would probably process within a relatively short time, I think within a one or two days, and the supply chain might be relatively short, or at least shorter than you have it normally for the cup lamp. So the big challenge here, especially in the second box, because farms often are in very remote areas, and uh, to bring that to the plantation, to the processing factory, you will require a lot of, sometimes several inter intermediaries who are handling that material 
And it's important, of course, when you start to get certified FSE, you cannot get, you have to keep track of what's going on. Okay. Um, a, a very few words before then moving to FSC about what I mean, engagement of Pirelli in natural upper sustainability. So we have been starting in 2014 with some of um, projects uh, training uh, farmers in good agriculture practice with our main partner in Indonesia in 2017, 2018. Um, we we uh, published our sustainable, Pirelli sustainable natural upper policy, the, our implementation manual and the roadmap for three years. All that was done in a cooperation, in a multi-stakeholder dialogue. So where we had car maker, um, processors, civil society, smallholders and tr traders in, in, in involved in the discussion. We are as well a founding member of GPSR, so the Global Platform for Sustainable Renage Rubber. And uh, I'm personally there co-chairing two working groups. One is the working group on capacity building, which I'm co-chairing with Chris. Schwarz from Rainforest Alliance, and the other one is the Smallholder Representation Working Group, which I'm co-chairing together with Pakreprius, a smallholder from Indonesia, previously with Julian Oram from Mighty Earth. So let's jump now more in the FSC world. So I think the left box we maybe can a bit ignore. I think that's probably um, everybody of you is aware about that who's joining this webinar. So what we did, we we I mean we produced, we published, we we announced our first FSC certified tire in May this year. And uh, we, um, it's, it's a cooperation together with BMW. What we did, we converted an, our factory in US, in Rome, Georgia, USA, to, you know, to only F produce, to co only consume and process FSC certified rubber and as well the textile, which we will see la later on again. So the whole factory now has been converted. It's of course not the biggest factory, but anyhow, it's 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 a it's a, a normal tire factory in in the Pirelli world. And um, so and we developed this product to equip uh, um, an amazing BMW X5, X Drive E45 E plug-in hybrid. So this was a development for the car and done. Let's say. A, always based on knowing that we would do that on an FSC tire. So the development over tires. Of course, the tire is rated A class rated in terms of rolling resistance. Um, I think we have been, since we, we, we published and announced this, uh, this achievement, the feedback from media and customers and has been amazing. So we really felt it, it has been perceived as an important step forward. And um, I think it has been as well a good, fantastic way of strengthening me, strengthening to a very good relationship which we have with our partner BMW in, um, I mean, I think has been perfect or excellent over years, but I think this helps even further to work along your supply chain on such kind of projects. So again, we have two materials which are certified. It is, you remember, it's around 20% rubber, 5%, 45% is textile. So the textile is the rayon coming from the from the forest as the natural rubber. And um, it's now you can find the logo of FSC on our tires inside, outside, outside just the logo, inside a bit more details. It says, of course, FSC um, um, natural rubber mix because we would not like to give the impression that everything, every ingredient of the tire is FSC certified. We know it's only, I mean, it's only rayon and rubber, but out of that, all of that is fully certified, okay? So um, I think in terms of, um, I think all of us and we know, and uh, John as well in introduction mentioned, it's, there are two elements. One is the FSC COC, and the other one is the FSC forest management. FSC COC, I would say, hmm, can be handled. It's, I mean, it's important to be able to segregate. Um, and uh, of course, we did we just converted the entire factory, so that's a bit easier. The segregation is a bit less complicated. Of course, you still have the, the issue on from the farm to, to the processing factory. Um, we are quite proud that we did really, um, this project is based on, on in cooperation with smallholder communities. So what, I mean, the farmers supplying the rubber to, to our factory in, um, in, uh, in, in at USA are really smallholders. I mean, the Southeast Asia is a smallholder context and it's really all smallholders. We have cooperatives part of that, smallholder groups, 
and they are of course part of our supply chain. Um, you know, important, I think it's don't expect that farmers will do that by themselves. I think they require, of course, technical and financial support. And I think, I mean, first of all, for the certification, but as a, as a follow up, I think it's not yet done. So you just get it from the certification. So I think it's important to continue to work with the farmers. Um, in terms of uh, long term commitment, I think we have been working on this project with Thai Eastern Group since 2016. I think that at least the meeting minutes I found. Um, so it has been a long way. Um, of course, you know, up to, you know, you know, need to identify which factory, which quantity, and which size. But of course, it has been an amazing, amazing journey. I mean, there are challenges, there's no doubt. If certifications happened in 20. 20, 2020 and 2021. So I think we all know it was COVID time and uh, you know, we never were wanted to expose any of our smallholders part of their project to any risk, health risk. Um, you know, you have farmers have to take action in regards to the buffer zones or the use of chemicals. You cannot use any more for weeding. And of course you need to keep track. So it's important to support farmers in this process. So it's not only the certification, it's, well, it's a follow up as you might lose farmers who don't care about it. So I think that's the last slide. I think I'm over. I see Trevor is putting on the, uh, so I, I think time is a bit over. So that I put that as last slide. I think that's an amazing picture with a beautiful car, great tire in a beautiful city. So the, the, uh, the car and the tire were presented during the Munich Motor Show earlier this year, I think May. And uh, I think a fantastic project. Thanks a lot to our partners, BMW and Thai Eastern, and of course as well as Ikrem in this project uh, going along together. Thanks a lot. Uh, I give the word back to you, Trevor. And thanks, Uli. I hadn't <laughs> actually seen this photo, so good, good to see some of this uh, work at the Munich Motor Show. Um, you talked a little bit about partnership and mentioned kind of the, the long-term journey that it's, that it's taken since 2015 with Thai Eastern Group. I wonder if you might just reflect a bit more broadly on kind of the importance and finding the right partners to achieve your sustainability goals kind of across and at all points of the value chain? Yeah, I, I think it's important to have the same, the same vision on these projects. It's not just that you go somewhere and say, okay, yeah, well, let's do like that. I think this comes up in conversation, in meetings you have, and you see if there is a right chemistry among the partners and the right priority. So we, we understood that Thai Tea Eastern, of course, is a partner really keen in working on that. They do a lot of other activities in their factory. So, um, yeah, I mean, you do that, and, and I think it's, it, you will understand who has it really in a kind of in your DNA and maybe who does it for, for other reasons. And I think we have here partners um, in this project who are really strongly con committed to do that. I think without partnership, no way. I mean, you would even not be able to to get the, the smallholders or the farmer groups involved. It's about partnership along the entire supply chain. So I think partnership, I think, is really crucial in that project. Great, thank you. And this was such an exciting announcement earlier this year, and um, I haven't yet seen this tire in the wild um, in real life, but if anyone does, please uh, send pictures across. This is great to see. Now, um, so that's a little bit, and we can stop sharing now, that is a little bit about the tire um, some of the milestones that have happened in the tire manufacturing industry. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and go into footwear. So um, I'm going to invite Tina to the stage from Hunter Boots. Thank you, Uli. Hi, Tina. Hi there. Um, let me just figure out how to share. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yep, it's coming up. Perfect. Good to go. Okay, excellent. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Tina, um, and I manage the sustainability program here at Hunter Boots in London. Um, yeah, just really pleased to be here today um, just to share a little bit about Hunter's journey with sourcing sustainable, um, certified sustainable natural rubber. Um, our rubber supply chain is a lot more direct um, and just a lot smaller than Pirelli's. Um, and it's also very different from Latex Co's. So I hope that between the three companies, you know, our three supply chains, we can provide you with some insights and ideas on how you can integrate FSC into your own rubber products. So 
just a really quick intro to our brand. Um, so Hunter was established in 1856 in Edinburgh um, as the North uh, British Rubber Company. Um, so originally we made a wide range of rubber products, um, but obviously uh, most notably um, the rubber Wellington boot, which uh, most people recognize today. Um, our boots are made with the same original techniques, so handcrafted from 28 different pieces of rubber molded onto what is known as a metal last or a metal mold. Um, and then vulcanized at a very high heat um, and high pressure. Um, and our boots are made with natural rubber latex, which is tapped from rubber trees. Um, because Hunter is arguably, you know, the world's most uh, globally recognized rubber Wellington boot, um, we have two royal warrants. Um, we know it's really, really important to lead by example. Um, we do a great deal of due diligence throughout our supply chain. Um, and given that rubber is our most valuable raw material, it's really important for us to get it right and make sure that it is responsibly sourced. So in August of this year, we launched something which we call Hunter Protect, um, and this is Hunter sustainability strategy and initiatives. Um, we outlined three key pillars, uh, which are protect our forests, uh, protect our resources, and protect our communities. Um, and we also made eight specific commitments for the year ahead, um, which I'll just very quickly scroll through here. Oops. Right. So today I'd like to focus on um, protect our forests, um, that pillar. Um, because natural rubber is at the heart of Hunter's brand, um, protecting our forests and the communities around them is critically important to our business. So this is why we've made the sector leading commitment to source 100% of our uh, rubber, natural rubber from FSC certified sources by 2025. Um, FSC is the gold standard for responsible forestry, whether we're talking about packaging, wood, uh, paper or rubber. So sourcing, um, you know, certified rubber gives Hunter the confidence that we're not contributing to deforestation, um, that, you know, our rubber meets the world's uh, strictest ecological and environmental standards, and that the rights of local and indigenous communities are being protected. Um, so, as many of you know, um, sourcing certified uh, sustainable rubber is a process. Um, we've been working really, really hard to transform our supply chain and bring our suppliers along on this journey with us. Um, so that's kind of what I'd like to share with you today. Ah, come on. Ah, there we go. No, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's see. All right, let's see, is that working? Great, okay. Um, so uh, starting about 10 years ago, uh, we began to trace our rubber supply chain back to the source. Um, we were told by other footwear brands um, in the industry that this is really difficult. It's a really opaque supply chain, um, you know, similar to leather. Um, and we were also told that, you know, we'd be likely to be able to figure out like pinpoint an agent um, in an office somewhere, but not the actual direct farms themselves. Um, so we just got to work. Um, I asked Hunter's third party um, footwear suppliers to just give me names of their agents. And as it turned out, most of the factories actually had direct relationships with rubber processing plants. Um, and as such, I was able to pinpoint the large plantations and smallholder communities that were selling their rubber to those plants. Um, only one footwear factory was actually buying their rubber through futures markets. Um, so what I did there was I just asked the factory um, to send me photographs of the actual, you know, company name that was on the pallets of rubber that were arriving uh, to their warehouse. And it was just fairly consistently just one or two uh, rubber suppliers in Vietnam. So um, step one, tracing the supply chain completed. Um, what we decided to do from that point uh, was to establish a direct relationship with the plantations. So I introduced Hunter, um, Hunter's sustainability ambitions to them. I asked them to accept social compliance audits. Um, 
And through those audits, um, we found some concerning but common issues relating to wages, working hours, and health and safety. Um, we also identified some more serious issues, which are common in the rubber industry, but not you know, in regular manufacturing itself necessarily. So for instance, the retention of passports of foreign migrant workers. So as this is a very serious issue, you know, we worked directly with these rubber processing plants to remediate all of these issues um, immediately. Um, so step two, um, forming direct uh, partnerships and relationships with uh, rubber suppliers and assessing human rights and labor risks, check there. Um, so after that, um, I knew I had to shift my focus over to uh, sustainability and efficiency in agriculture and farming, um, environmental and ecological best practice, and sustain uh, responsible forestry. So here, I was definitely out of my depth. Um, so what I did here was I reached out to the giants. Um, so I reached out to the tire industry, um, and Michelin in particular were very open about sharing their sustainable rubber sourcing standards, their their challenges and their learnings. Um, they invited Hunter to tire industry conferences and meetings around sustainable uh, natural rubber, um, including uh, GPSNR, which Uli mentioned in his presentation. So I just spent those years uh, just learning and absorbing. And during my regular visits to Hunter's rubber suppliers, um, I would just pass this knowledge and best practice on to them. Um, yeah, so over those years, you know, we really built up a fairly open and trusting relationship with the processing plants and select smallholder communities. Um, and then in 2018, we got in touch with FSC because they had just recently begun to expand their work into certifying uh, natural rubber value chains. Um, so it was at this stage, you know, there was still a very low supply and low demand of FSC rubber, um, and we found the price to be just too prohibitive um, for our work. Um, and yeah, just too, too low a supply for us to make any sort of meaningful commitment to, to uh, sourcing certified sustainable natural rubber. Um, so this was when we decided to just build upon the great work that we'd done with our own rubber suppliers um, over the past few years, um, and we encouraged them to become certified to the FSC standard, um, thereby securing our own supply. Um, we shared our intention to eventually source all of our rubber from FSC certified sources. Um, we asked our rubber suppliers to join us on this journey. You know, the first plantation um, that we worked with will have their FSC certification uh, this month. Um, we've also worked with our footwear factories to become chain of custody certified. So yeah, just over the past two years, we've just been working in really close partnership with our suppliers to improve standards um, and achieve best practice in responsible forestry. Um, we also recently published our forest materials policy, which is available on our website for um, anyone to access. Uh, we developed a manual on responsible forestry for land managers. Um, and just yesterday, uh, Rainforest Alliance conducted some training to Hunter's sourcing team, designers, and product development team on um, the responsible sourcing of forest materials. Um, and we're planning, planning to conduct similar training to our rubber, packaging, um, and wood suppliers next month. Um, internally, um, prior to making this commitment to source 100% of our rubber from FSC certified sources by 2025, um, we had a couple of challenges uh, to overcome. So first, the price of FSC rubber is obviously higher than non-certified rubber. Um, we've done a lot, a lot of price modeling internally over the past two years, um, and we have in that time figured out a strategy for absorbing this premium ourselves. Um, Secondly, um, we struggled with the idea of, you know, having some boots be certified and other boots not be certified. Obviously, we couldn't transform, you know, all our products into FSC certified products overnight. Um, but we decided that if we were transparent with our customers and kind of shared with them our strategy for sourcing FSC certified rubber and sustainability in general, um, this actually just wouldn't be such a big problem. And we haven't found it to be um, confusing or problematic at all. Um, thirdly, um, we struggled with the supply of FSC rubber um, in the specific grade that we buy to make um, rubber Wellington boots. So I've already mentioned that, but you know we encouraged um, and incentivized our rubber suppliers to become certified to the FSC standard. Um, and we really support the FSC system. Um, so we really welcome other footwear brands to do the same with your suppliers. Um, and finally, we had some initial challenges with communicating our FSC products to our customers. Um, we found that customers 
um, recognize the FSC logo on paper and packaging, um, as well as wood, but not necessarily on rubber. So we learned that, you know, we ourselves need to more actively engage with and educate our consumers on both FSC and sustainability. Um, so what we did was we renamed our FSC boot, the Protect Our Forests boot. Um, we created playful and striking imagery um, for our various channels um, of the boot sitting in nature, um, sitting in the forest, sitting alongside trees. Um, and we also created a richer and deeper story around our boots connection to forests by donating proceeds of our uh, autumn winter 21 boot to the World Land Trust, which is a charity that protects forests. So um, yeah, so as a business, we've seen many benefits of FSC certification. Um, we've been able to transform our supply chain um, and take our suppliers on this journey of responsible sourcing um, of forest materials. Um, we've had the opportunity to engage with purposeful NGOs such as FSC, World Land Trust, um, and Rainforest Alliance. Um, we've been able to drum up excitement within our internal teams um, around this product, um, and we've also found creative ways to engage with our customers on FSC um, and sustainability comms in a meaningful way. Great. Thank you so much, Tina. You've covered a lot of ground in um, eight minutes, so appreciate that. What I find particularly and always inspiring when I hear this story is that Hunter was the first to make such a public declaration in the kind of footwear space regarding sourcing FSC certified rubber by 2025. So in a way, you've kind of had to be the first mover, which I imagine took a lot of um, bravery to do when no one else had necessarily done something like that. But now things have changed um, in, in a sense of there's much more progress and, as you mentioned, much more kind of broader engagement when it comes to collaboration. Um, and I just wondered maybe if you could, um, you know, what future opportunities might you see um, now that it's kind of there's getting to be more momentum behind this and any examples of kind of wider collaboration that you might be able to share with us? Yeah, sure. Um... I mean, in general, you know, Hunter's really happy to collaborate with other footwear brands and um, and and other uh, you know companies that are sourcing rubber with regards to FSC rubber sourcing. Um, we have this one plantation that we've been working with for over 13 years, which is becoming certified this month. We're happy to share their details. You know, they've invested a lot of time and effort um, into becoming FSC certified, so we just want their business to really thrive. Um, we're also happy to speak to anyone who has any further questions. Um, after this presentation, I'm always happy um, to schedule a call um, and just talk about our journey um, uh, to this point. Um, and in terms of, I guess, like B2B partnerships, you know, we're always pleased to collaborate with brands that share Hunter's sustainability values. Um, we recently collaborated with Selfridges. Um, so they're a leading department store in the UK um, to create an exclusive FSC boot with them. Um, so this is only on sale in their stores exclusively. Um, and we also find that when we speak to other um, fashion brands that we, you know, are looking to collaborate with or B2B partners, um, when we tell them about uh, our FSC rubber um, and our sustainability story in general, um, they get very, very excited. So, Fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, what, one question from the audience for you, Tina, is just if you could clarify kind of the, the rubber volume. Um, obviously, it sounds like it's, it's kind of expanding, but maybe just a little bit of detail in terms of um, the total rubber volume kind of, you know, at, at the moment. Sure. Um, so uh, hopefully I'll get these numbers right. Um, but basically, um, we are hoping to source 100% of our um, rubber by 2025. That is about between 2000 and 2000, you know, 2000, 2600 tons um, of uh, natural rubber. Um, and in 2022, we're aiming to increase our rubber consumption from, I think it's something like 13 tons to 400 tons. So we're making a really big leap in this first year. Um, yeah. Great. And thank you so much, Tina. It's been a, a very inspiring discussion presentation. So thank you for your time. So now, now that we've covered footwear, we're going to zoom out and then zoom back into another industry, which is upholstery. So um, we're going to invite Dieter from the Texco up to the stage to talk about mattresses. So, um, Dieter, if you don't mind sharing your screen, we'll get started. 
I don't mind at all. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, if you just would give me a, a second to find back my presentation, hang on a second. I'll be with you in a minute. Where is that presentation? Uh, it's not. It was a thing. I see it on my screen, but you guys don't see it on your screen. Um, I it's think it's not the right one. Hang on, stop share. Hold for doom. I do apologize, guys. Um, stop share. Are you seeing my presentation? Not at all. Just white at the moment. Um, it's just white. Share yeah. Very there abstract it presentation. There it, there it is. Yes, here we go. Yep. Okay, perfect. Over okay. to you, Dieter. Yes. Sorry about that, guys. Thank you all for having me. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about LaTeXCo and why do we uh, very well go for FSC LaTeX. Um, just a little bit on LaTeXCo. We are Europe's leading manufacturer of LaTeX components. And we also do some, some foams and we also make pocket springs. Everything that we do, uh, all the products that we do go into the bedding industry. Um, small company, family owned, just over 150 million euro turnover. But we do think that we have the strengths of an international organization. And everything that we do, and everything that we always have been doing, um, is producing high quality products with an as good as possible service, but everything should be made in an ecological, balanced and sustainable way. Global presence, headquarters are in Belgium, and the center of Europe. Production unit um, in Belgium as well, the largest production unit, um, Spain, the States, and then we do have an operation in Indonesia. All the rest is just um, sales offices worldwide. We export globally. Um, two thirds of what we do stays in Europe. The rest goes um, overseas, but of course, the largest market is the US, where we sell to our own. A company who is selling them um, to the American market. And that is on the Tesco, and I don't think you need anything more. But why do we, why does La Tesco engage itself heavily into sustainability? Simple. It's just part of our DNA since the very start. Um, and I'll show you a, bit, a little bit why that is. First of all, we work with a natural product, we work with natural latex. And in our product portfolio, um, mattresses or pillows uh, that do not contain any natural latex or simple less good of comfort. The comfort of natural latex in bed is unequaled. So we need nature, um, so we need to protect it. We are producing over 10% of our own um, energy and we do need quite a bit of energy and um, we were the first ones in our industry to invest in a closed loop water purification unit in this company here where i'm now in the headquarters um, we use per hour over 12,000 liters of water um, 1.5 percent is fresh water the rest is the rest is recycled in a closed loop um, yearly, we um, purify 75, the equivalent of 75 Olympic swimming pools. But that's not all. Already back in 1998, we founded our own um, recycling unit, Litexco Solutions. Um, and all the waste that we produce, and we do produce a bit of waste, um, over 5 million kilograms, um, we recycle it ourselves and turn it into new products. Um, dairy cow, milk cows, they produce more milk when they rest on our mattresses. Again, the milk cow mattresses. But products are also transformed into machinery equipment, into transport, and some in bedding and furniture, sports, and the building industry. Um, insulation, both acoustic as thermal insulation, can be made with products that before 1998 were considered to be waste. 
hang on a second. We're part of Valumat. Valumat is a Belgian organization um, that has been created to start up recycling used mattresses. Um, we get end, end, end of life um, consumer products recycle that as well and turn that into our Latexco Solutions company into the new products that you just um, saw. Now, global warming is a problem and we all have a responsibility. The rubber production produces 1 billion, of, 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas every year. We're the second uh, largest producer of greenhouse gas after apparel. Um, so we need to produce consciously. Sustainability is top of mind by ourselves, but also by the consumers and the younger generations. Um, you cannot have one day and look at the press, look at television, and people are not talking about sustainability. We see that everywhere. Um, H&M, eh, the apparel producer, where years ago, people in fashion were talking about fashion and the new collections. We're now talking about innovate. Let's clean up, be conscious, let's change, let's close the loop. So quite important. And this guy is Larry Fink. He is the CEO of BlackRock. BlackRock is a multinational investment management corporation. And back in the 70s, um, Mr. Um, Larry Fink, yeah, doors are the most important thing in life. At that time, BlackRock was saying, companies must make profit. This is our goal. When in, in his letter back in 2020, what he wrote to his um, chief executives, sustainability is the most important thing. We will not any longer invest in companies that do not have a purpose, that do not take care about the planet. Now, so you see the change back in the 70s. The only thing which counted was dollars or euros or pounds or whatever, money. Today, it's about responsibility. We are uniquely positioned in, at least in our business, in our bedding business, because we, as Latexco, are the global leader when it comes to producing bed products, bedding products, sorry, um, with natural latex. We support your dreams, but slowly, slowly, we have been thinking about changing our um, idea to become a, comp a company that protects your dreams. It's like Hunter, eh? we was talking about uh, protecting as well. And it's just, it's simply not a slogan. It's something that you need to do, otherwise you will not have a future. That is why we have decided to change over all the, all the natural latex that we use in our company by the second quarter of next year must be FSC certified. Um, all the mattress cores that we produce today in 100% natural latex, because we also have some other blends, 50-50, 20-80, whatever. When I say 20-80 or 50-50, I say 50 synthetic latex, 50 uh, natural latex, 20 synthetic latex, 80 natural latex. Every, all We start with the products that are 100% natural latex. They are today 100% FSC certified. Quarter two next year, even all our blended products must be FSC certified. Why? Because we don't see there's another option. You need to respect your natural sources. And if you don't do it, you will not survive. Um, my presentation is shorter than the eight minutes. Um, we're also a smaller company. So feel free to raise your questions. 
<laughs> yes, thank you, Dieter. One question I had for you, so just talking a little bit about that commitment that you mentioned there mm -hmm. um, at the end, it sounds like you've made a big leap and step when it comes to FSC sort of mm -hmm. natural rubber. Um, what, what, what signs encouraged you to take that step? And um, the second part of the question would be, mm -hmm. what were the benefits of doing it all at once versus kind of a step-by-step -step, um, approach? So kind of what gave you the confidence to just come out and kind of do it in such a strong way that you've just yeah. shared? Well, as I said, first of all, it's part of our DNA, but we also have some bigger customers who are also taking the lead. Um, and we definitely want to secure um, the, the, the capacity that we will need. Um, so we, we will need by the end of 2022, some 10,000 tons of natural latex all certified. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons. But what we also see is that we see a trend um, that our natural latex products or growing um, steeply um, in all countries all over Europe, the demand for natural latex products in bed is growing. Um, and the fact that your latex will come from plantations that do respect the environment will help you to boost even that steep climb and to grow even more um, and we think it's, it's important that um, the plantations where your rubber, rubber milk is coming from work in a respectful way towards the environment. Great. So it sounds like it's a, lots of dynamics kind of contributing to this mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. co customer demand, consumer kind of want into supply chain and partners kind of um, moving mm -hmm. along this way too. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I wanted to switch now, if you don't mind, to stop sharing, um, Dieter, to bring um, Hunter and Pirelli back into the conversation now, too. Um, so we've, we've seen three very different, well, similar, but quite different industries in terms of the supply chain and how they're structured. And I wanted to kind of ask, it's sort of a time machine question and full disclosure, but um, what, what I've heard from all of the panelists is that this has been a long journey, and part of it is because it's the first time that it's been done to a large extent in each of these um, industries, respectively. Um, but things are now changing. And um, I just wondered, you know, through that journey, there's been lots of learnings, I would imagine. And some of the people joining from the audience may be at a different part of this journey. So um, the question for, for all of you really is um, just kind of what advice you would give your former self. So um, if you were five years ago or even longer, um, knowing what you know now, um, what might you have um, kind of told yourself back in the future if you were to have to do this all over again? Um, and maybe let's start with you, um, Uli from Pirelli. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Trevor, uh, for the question. I mean, it, it has been, of course, a, a long journey. You know, I think it's, of course, you need to you need to have a certain page. You now you talk with. Uh, um, you know, farmers which might be not used to being certified in a lot of different ways of handling. So it must be really make a change. Now it's important by following the FSC, it's, it's really a change. And you have to, you know, have to share this uh, along the way. And so you have to be a bit patient. This is what I'm always you need. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's important to be then transparent, to bring it along the supply chain, to share this vision with your people so that everybody really believes in it. If it's just to get something done for a marketing perspective, I think that really doesn't, uh, doesn't help you. It has to be something as I think uh, um, Dieter as well mentioned, it's some, something in the DNA, you need to have right partners. But of course, again, it's about of now spreading that out to bring more people on board and welcome more in all of our supply chains to have uh, more participants in, in, in going on this, this way. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's important that I think all of us are open to cooperate uh, with more partners in, in this journey. And uh, that's important. So we can, that's the only way we have, we, we can make the change. It has been the first way, first time for us producing or in the industry, the FSC certified tires. I hope that will come more to come of course. <laughs> Great, thanks for that. And Tino, same question to you. What would you tell your, your former self as you 
embarked on this journey? Yeah, I think similar to Uli, just, um, you know, don't be paralyzed by trying to do everything at once um, and perfectly. Um, sourcing, you know, certified sustainable natural rubber and indeed, you know, sourcing sustainably, period. <laughs> uh, it's a process um, and it's a journey. Um, so, and, you know, it's just a step by step process. I think definitely. Um, it's also a very collaborative process. So, you know, as brands, we need to learn to work together with our rubber suppliers and smallholders um, to understand what their needs are um, and to kind of find solutions that work for everybody. You know, we can't just be demanding um, changes or improvements um, from our end and just hope that it magically appears um, and happens. And I think probably last thing, which I definitely did do, was just ask for help. You know, um, other companies out there very happy and willing to help um, share what they've learned just to make the process a lot easier for you. So definitely reach out to people. And I think you said, Tina, at one point you had some questions for, for Uli, um, I think, at a previous um, previous <laughs> venture. So um, yeah, definitely Uli kind of a nice are, community. Yeah, there. we're <laughs> buddies back from 2019. I think we were in Southern Thailand together. So yeah, shared a lot of interesting conversations there. The rubber folk have to stick together, I think, it sounds like. So good to hear that. Um, Dieter, what, what advice would you give yourself, too, um, just in the future as you started this journey? Yeah, well, for me, it's quite simple. It's, it's a quadruple win. It's a win for the plantations because they will preserve what, what they are doing. They will, they, will pre they will work in a more healthy way. That's number one. It's a win for the tech school because we have something to offer to our customers. It's a win for our customers. And when I say customers, in this perspective, I, I speak about my B2B customers. I speak about the, the, late, the, the mattress manufacturers as well as about the, the retailers. But it's, and that's the most important thing, is the win for us all as consumers. Because doing this, going for this journey is that we, we avoid, we make sure that um, the plantations work in a better way we avoid that they would go the other way um, you hear negative things about palm oil plantations um, we don't want to have that with rubber plantations and i'm pretty sure that palm oil will also take this step in a bigger way you you simply cannot ignore it it's the way we have to go and we have to go with all this planet in this in the same way thank you and um, just to bring Sean from FSC into the discussion, I think, you know, FSC is, is about protecting the world's forests when it comes to it at the end of the day. Um, and maybe more general than yourself, but maybe maybe some advice, let's say, to anyone um, in the audience, anyone who watches the recording who may be trying to get started on this journey. Um, Sean, how would you kind of advise them to get started? Um, I think uh, there's many ways to, to go about this, but it really starts with yourself and understanding, learning about the, the challenges and issues with uh, that, that come from rubber. Um, I think it's it, having the motivation is the key thing. And you can do research on this pretty easily, uh, looking at, at research from other environmental NGOs. Um, but then uh, you need to focus on the customer that, that wants to see sustainable improvements. And then uh, it doesn't matter how small you are. You can, uh, as a brand, make a change by, by working with, with other brands and also by working with your entire supply chain. Uh, just in the last year, I've seen a lot of collaboration uh, in the footwear sector. So would really uh, congratulate that. Um, Maybe uh, real quick, I, I, I also saw a, a question in, in, the, uh, in the chat from David Shaw about the uh, price difference between FSC and non-FSC. I didn't want to answer this uh, just with a single line of text, but um, it, it depends. But essentially, there's a couple different mechanisms for having uh, higher wages for the, the smallholders that are selling rubber. Uh, there's guaranteed living wage. There's more bargaining power as a result of having sustainable rubber, uh, the collective bargaining that you get naturally from uh, group certification 
you have increased transparency uh, in the supply chain. So it's not just being necessarily purchased by a middleman and then traded several stages um, until it finally reaches a factory. Uh, and then they're following best forestry practices. So you're generally getting better yields uh, over a longer duration. So the, the value that you bring to the plantation uh, is increased through a, a variety of different ways. Um, and then kind of going full circle with the environmental aspect by using less chemicals, uh, you can increase the, the soil health and uh, biodiversity, uh, making it easier to have agroforestry and um, uh, harvest different different products and stuff. So it's a right. tough one to answer. We don't yeah. we don't necessarily track this, but um, we're hoping to have more transparency on this with these videos I talked about. Great, thanks. And Sean, I think now we're um, we're at time, so we're coming to a close here on this webinar. Um, and Sean, I don't know if you can see my screen, but there's kind of a final slide from you, which just highlights um, what is the step and how does one kind of achieve some of the certification end to end across the value chain that we've been hearing um, from these various industries throughout this presentation. Great. Um, really, there's there's no formula necessarily, but every, everyone really asks this, but I think you need to start with uh, enabling your supply chain to provide FSC. Uh, you need to, to put it in your procurement policy and, and bargain with your suppliers, um, and work with them to, to get it. Um, it's not a flick of a flip of the switch, um, but then you need to actually try it. So first put it in policy, but then do as, as these three speakers have, you have to put it into one of your products and then learn how FSC works. That's, that's the only way to really to go. I think this is the most important thing. Um, the third thing is something that is going to be happening uh, throughout. It's not necessarily the third thing, but it's an ongoing journey where you're constantly collaborating with your supply chain to address roadblocks. Um, this is probably where you can uh, engage with us to, and collaborate with other companies to, to figure out how you can address these roadblocks. Um, and then this, this last one is something that so far has not been done in the rubber sector but uh, is done a lot in the paper sector and, and other industries. Controlled wood, um, as, as it's normally known, I would call it controlled rubber, is a way to at least eliminate the unacceptable, unacceptable practices in uh, rubber uh, harvesting. Uh, and this can be mixed in certain chain of custody situations. Um, and then the last point is that you make a commitment. Uh, this is the this is really the way to show to your supply chain, to your customers, that yeah, this isn't uh, just a marketing uh, ploy. It's it's something that you're you're working towards, and uh, only when you you make a commitment uh, will you, you will you reach that. Um, we're no longer at the point where you can just say that there's not enough certified supply. And on that note, um, I wanted to thank all of our, our panelists, Uli, um, Tina, and Dieter, um, for their time, and to thank all of the, the participants in the audience um, from Vietnam, Thailand, Germany, UK, all around the world um, for tuning in to this. I hope it proved to be um, not just inspiring, but also helpful and practically um, motivating in terms of um, giving you the confidence that this is possible. And, and as we look forward into next year and beyond, um, there's much more that can be done, especially through transparency and collaboration, as Sean mentioned. So um, many thanks to all of you. And um, yes, if you have any questions, we'll continue to answer and address them in the chat. But thank you all so much for your time. Bye-bye.